All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Daniel Bohannon, and today I'll be talking about um, PowerShell obfuscation, um, in particular uh, a tool that I released last month called Invoke Cradle Crafter, um, and hopefully that'll be uh, uh, interesting. Uh, so just a quick blurb about me. I'm uh, an incident response consultant uh, with Mandiant, based out of the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and uh, I've been there for about two years, um, and I've kind of been transitioning into more of a research role at Mandiant um, with detection research, evasion, basically the kind of stuff we'll be talking about today. Um, prior to that, I was uh, actually work working for five years in operations and then transitioned into security um, for a, a restaurant franchise here in the U.S. So a quick overview of what we're going to go through. Um, I, I kind of broke this up into purple, red, and blue um, because being a blue team guy that I find myself talking about what most people will consider red team stuff. What's really important to me and the reason I do this research is so that we as defenders can be uh, better educated in what attackers are doing and more importantly, what is possible that we have yet to see them do and are we able to detect this kind of activity. And, uh, and a lot of times when we're doing uh, uh, in investigations with Mandiant, um, pretty much no one has all their stuff together. And we're, we're a lot of times trying to figure out, okay, they don't have logs, they don't have this, they don't have that. What's a, what's a weird artifact we can find to, to lead us to these systems that have this activity? Um, and so I'll be sharing a lot of that. And actually, I've baked it into the tool so that as you use the tool and explore these different categories um, of, um, of syntaxes, I'll actually outline, here's artifacts left behind when this happens. Here's indicators. Um, here's the process. Here's a DLL that's loaded. Here's a process that makes a network connection as opposed to PowerShell. Um, and and my, my hope and goal is that as defenders we'll be better educated in looking for these different kinds of activities. And as a red teamer, my hope is that you'd be better educated in figuring out what makes the most sense, which is the most meaningful um, syntax to use um, in my scenario. So. Uh, after we cover some of that, we'll look at um, kind, of, kind of the state of obfuscation today. What kind of obfuscation exists? What kind of obfuscation do we see attackers using? Um, and then how well are we as an industry doing at detecting this kind of obfuscation? And then we'll look at some of the new stuff, um, looking at different cradle syntaxes, kind of breaking it down into three, three buckets of new material here. And that is looking at obscure download cradles. And what I mean by that is um, basically pretty much a one-liner that will allow you to remotely download a script and execute it usually entirely in memory. Um, and attackers are using this all the time. Attackers, pen testers, et cetera. We'll then look at some interesting um, token obfuscation, um, which, uh, which is a bit different than uh, any of the other obfuscation that I've covered before. Um, and then we'll look at some obscure invocation syntaxes, which again is also very different from what I've covered before. Um, and then we'll look at what does it look like to actually start trying to detect some of these really cryptic download cradles um, from an artifact and indicator um, uh, perspective. And then we'll go through a, a, a demo, and hopefully that will go well. So three things that I want to cover up front, um, because I get a lot of questions on, um, on this kind of stuff. The first one, blocking PowerShell is not a realistic option. And the simple sentence that explains this best is PowerShell is so much more than PowerShell.exe. PowerShell.exe is a host application. The real heart and guts of PowerShell is systemmanagementautomation.dll. And anything can load that. So blocking PowerShell.exe is, is a fool's errand if you're trying to block all avenues in which PowerShell can run. The second one, uh, this is a quote by noted blue teamer Jared Haight. Um, and he said, PowerShell is not special. And it was funny, because at a conference where he said that, Jeffrey Snover, the father of PowerShell, was, was there. So that was, a, that was an interesting conversation afterwards. But what he really meant by that was, like, how is it different than, like, PowerShell's been getting a lot of um, focus, especially looking at increased use of PowerShell and attacks, and PowerShell is evil. And this is what leads people to that first point right there. But PowerShell is just an amazing platform that you can use for good or evil. So at the end of the day, when you look at reports talking about the increased use of PowerShell and attacks, if a user is enabling a macro and PowerShell happens to be the code that downloads some binary, that's really not much of a PowerShell problem. It's a user opening a freaking macro problem. So there's other, there's other things that lead you to this place. And again, PowerShell, there's a lot of good you can do with PowerShell, especially when we look at some of the, um, uh, some of the, some of the just incredible logging and features that have been built into PowerShell 5 um, that Microsoft has really done a lot to improve the security um, and make it a really, really robust platform. And that leads me to the last point. PowerShell 5 is your new best friend. And I say new in quotes because it's been around for a while. But no one has it. Um, 
So if you're on Windows 10, you have it, but there's still a lot of logging and things that you can enable that I would highly recommend you enable. Um, and these are two uh, blog posts. One is by my colleague, Matt Dunwoody, looking at um, a, really, a really robust view of all the logging that PowerShell 5 gives you. Um, and then this uh, next blog post is actually from Microsoft. It's called Microsoft Hearts the Blue Team. And it is actually a blog post and a white paper. It is an incredible read, um, really, really worth it. Um, they've put a lot of work into PowerShell. So uh, my motivation in this, we see attackers using PowerShell all the time. Um, there really is not an investigation that goes by where we don't see PowerShell being used at some point in the investigation, mainly for initial compromise and dumping credentials. But we see it used um, for uh, sniping email, a lot of other stuff like that. Um, and uh, why do attackers use it? Well, it's native, it's Windows signed. Um, typically, uh, if you have app, app whitelisting, you're gonna allow it um, by default. Um, and it's really impossible to detect, for the most part, if you don't have at least command line logging. And ideally, you also have PowerShell logging. So um, why more obfuscation? Um, a lot of the, the guys in my office say, hey, like, what's your sickness? Like, haven't you done enough to make our, our lives miserable um, with, when it comes to PowerShell obfuscation? And um, really, the, the reason is atta attackers have been getting more creative with obfuscation in the past six months. Um, they've been using some new tools that make it really easy, and so we've been seeing a lot more of it. And so uh, as, as I was doing some previous research, I really started to focus on what are weird ways that I can remotely download code in PowerShell, and that's the main um, kind of compilation of ideas that led to this research and, uh, and this tool development. And so Invoke Cradle Crafter, in a nutshell, it's a living library of all these different ways you can remotely download PowerShell code and it introduces new obfuscation techniques um, and is really a platform to educate the users, both red and blue, why this cradle is different from that one and um, what indicators are left behind, really focusing on the artifacts and behaviors. So the current state of PowerShell obfuscation. So uh, last year at DerbyCon, I released this tool called Invoke Obfuscation. Um, it's an open source uh, framework. It's available on my GitHub. And it basically automates the obfuscation of any arbitrary PowerShell command or script um, using what's called tokenization to basically go throughout a script and find here's every token, here's every string, here's every member argument, blah, blah, blah. And so basically, it randomizes the obfuscation syntax at four layers, which I'm going to go through extremely briefly. Because I think it's important to see the, the current state of obfuscation before we look at how this new work is different and why both are important. Um, so at a token layer, string layer, encoding layer, and launcher layer, these are the four that we'll look at. So the very first, the token. So this is, at the very top, this is our attacker command, right? It's the most common remote download uh, cradle syntax that we see attackers using. Basically, new object net that web client, and then we're saying, calling the method download string to get that payload, and then that result is going into invoke expression, which is pretty much like PowerShell's eval statement. So let's say this is our attacker command at the top, and as a defender, how could we de detect this? If we see this on the command line, what we could do is say, okay, if I see these strings, then that would catch this exact command, right? If we say and, 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 that would catch this. So let's look at obfuscation at a token layer and see how can we as an attacker be surreptitious in obfuscating the command, and as a defender, as we see each change, let's update our detection to, to stay up with it. So for example, the very first one, system dot. Whenever you see this in PowerShell, totally not necessary. It'll automatically add that and assume that. So an attacker doesn't have to put that in their command. And so as a defender, we shouldn't have it in our command either. Next, um, URL. So this is a string object. And it can be concatenated in line. We can also use double quotes, single quotes. We can push it over with white space. We could also just set it in another variable if we wanted to. But uh, we'll remove HTTP from our download string um, indicator. Still going, so download string. This is the most common method of the net.webclient class that attackers use, but it's not the only one. And it's definitely not the only one that we should be looking for because we have seen attackers and a bit of commodity malware using some of these different methods. We have download file, download data, and actually this open read, which uh, I've only seen used one time and most people don't look for. Um, but uh, these are all totally valid. Now, an interesting point here. In invoke obfuscation, since it has to handle any arbitrary PowerShell command or script, um, it actually can't swap these methods. Because the first one's going to return an expression. Download file is actually going to download it to disk. And download data is going to be a byte, uh, a byte array. And open read is going to be a byte stream. So there's more context you need to have um, when you're looking at these different methods. So invoke obfuscation will never substitute different methods. 
Invoke Cradle Crafter will, because Invoke Cradle Crafter is not taking arbitrary commands or scripts, it's taking a few pieces of information and then allowing you to just completely obfuscate these predefined um, Cradle syntaxes, and you can obfuscate the ordering and a lot of other stuff, which we'll see. But the, the, one of the main differences between the two tools is this ability to do substitution because we're, having, we're working with a more constrained um, set of language that has been defined by the tool. Um, so uh, invoke obfuscation, we'll say, okay, download string, this is, a, um, this is a method. So we can put single quotes around it. And now this dot is going to uh, cause us issues if we have that in our rule. So we'll go ahead and remove that. What we can also do is we can put double quotes around it. And I want you to look really closely at this download string because what you can also do with double quotes is you can put a tick mark there. Now why does that work? Well, you can also put a lot of tick marks. And the reason that it works is because it is, um, uh, it is PowerShell's escape character. Um, and it has meaning behind things like you know, in for new line, stuff like that. Um, but as you can see, if we just uppercase that in, then it no longer has special meaning. It's just a tick mark. And so PowerShell will automatically remove that because it says, hey, you don't have any meaning here. But the great part is, is that this persists not only into command line arguments, but also into any logging of PowerShell and command line um, at the logging or live process level. Um, so you can do that with our, uh, the methods. When you look at an argument like net.webclient, you can do the same thing. There's a lot of options you can do there, but we'll just go with that one. When it comes to new object, invoke obfuscation has three ways of dealing with um, commandlets, which is what new object is. You can put tick marks in the commandlet. Um, you can also treat the commandlet as a string and concatenate it. And then you can invoke it with either an ampersand or a dot, which are the invocation operators. Um, or you can do this little trick, which is using the format operator, which basically says, chop up this string into a substring, reorder it however you want, and then piece it back together in whatever order that you want. This is what invoke obfuscation does. But what about some other options? We can do something like git command, which basically says, show me all the commands, and then let me invoke the object that comes back. But the great thing is that you can start to do things like use wildcards. And so this will still return new object, but new object is never spelled out anywhere on the command line. So that's new object now. And in addition, for git command, we can use an alias like GCM. Um, and if you'll notice here, this execution context is an automatic variable in PowerShell. Well, dollar sign is the most common way to call or set variables, but you can also use git variable. There's like, there's a slide later that shows all the different options to retrieve the variable um, value, but this is now that variable. So as you can see, doing simple string searching, even regex for certain terms like new object can really bite you because you'll never see it in logs. Um, so at this point, we're left with invoke expression, which is actually a pretty good indicator in and of itself. But there's obviously stuff that we can do there. Um, and so invoke expression is the main thing that invoke obfuscation dealt with. And in the last release, um, I added some tricks like this, um, which is basically uh, one of the aliases for invoke expression is IEX. And there's a lot of places that you can pull the letters I and E and X out of environment variables, automatic variables, et cetera. So shell ID is an automatic variable in PowerShell that literally outputs Microsoft.PowerShell. And so if you'll see, M is in the zeroth index, um, I is in the first index, so shell ID one is an I, shell ID 13 is an E, and then we just add an X, and that little dot is the invocation operator. So now this is invoke expression. So that was all token layer. And the, the, of, the, of the four layers, token layer is really important because this is the only one that is not deobfuscated in PowerShell's most robust logging in PowerShell 5, which is called script lock logging. So any kind of uh, antivirus that uses Microsoft's AMSI, which is the anti-malware scan interface, it has to take this into account. And so far, it's not. So if you, say, are running Invoke Mimikatz in memory with updated Windows Defender, it will block it. But if you'd run it through one layer of this obfuscation, it's last I checked still is not getting blocked at all. So the second layer is string layer, which basically says you can do all this obfuscation for the command, but you can always take one more step back and say, now convert this entire thing to a string, obfuscate it however you want to as a string, and then you can invoke it. And so in invoke obfuscation, you can concatenate it, you can reorder it, you can also just reverse the entire command and then invoke in memory the reversed normalized version of that command. So that's layer two. Layer three is encoding. Um, and so in the current uh, public version of invoke obfuscation, these are the options. Um, most attackers use base64 encoding just because that's what 
all the frameworks you use, but there's a lot of other options like ASCII hex, octal binary, bitwise XOR. Um, and then secure string is actually encryption, but you can actually store uh, code and PowerShell snippets inside of password objects and then rip them out of that context into plain text and invoke them uh, that way. And lastly is launchers. Um, so there's really obscure ways in which you can launch PowerShell code. What I'm not talking about is a subject called uh, unmanaged PowerShell, which kind of goes back to the notion that PowerShell is so much more than PowerShell.exe. So I'm not referring to that at all. This is still using PowerShell.exe, but it's pushing the command line arguments into other processes. So one way we can do that is we can use command to basically set uh, variable one with our PowerShell command, which is this nice write host success, uh, will then set variable two to be PowerShell dash. Now PowerShell dash is one of the syntaxes. If you just do PowerShell slash question mark for the help page, it'll say, hey, there's this implied variable called command. But you could also just do a dash, and now the command is gonna be received as standard input. So that's what that dash means. So then we're taking a second command, and we're saying, well, I'm gonna echo var one into var two, which really is gonna translate into something that looks like this, but you don't see this on the command line. So now what this means as a defenders is that we see PowerShell run and its argument is just a simple dash, and the parent argument doesn't even have the actual PowerShell command, it just has these variable names. So the grandparent process in this scenario is where the actual arguments reside. Um, and if you think that a foolproof way is to recursively go up the process tree, that's definitely not the case because you can actually start to spread your pieces of command into unrelated processes through things like uh, WMI, clipboard, et cetera. Now, there's one financial threat actor that's been using this technique a lot, and it's been really cool to see, and that is a group that we call Fin8. And so uh, this actually was an interesting uh, tweet by John Lambert from Microsoft. If you're not following him, he, he tweets some really, really good stuff um, of like, here's real evil I just found this morning. Um, he, he's at Microsoft and does a lot of stuff with um, Azure and uh, I think maybe even Office 365. I apologize, I'm not 100% sure on that, but really tweets awesome stuff. So February 22nd, he uh, tweeted this and said, hey, here's some interesting OPSEC, some obfuscation going on in this document here. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, replied back and said, hey, this actually lines up really well with some Fin8 stuff that we just saw this week. Here's a decoder I wrote and put on my GitHub to make uh, extracting indicators a lot easier. And then one of my other colleagues uh, put a, a screenshot shot up that uh, Lambert posted and said, yeah, this is totally Fin8, and here's what we've been seeing. And so there's this screenshot, and if you'll notice, three pieces, at the very bottom, this is the PowerShell command that's being put in an environment variable one, which they're calling Microsoft Update Catalog. And you'll notice PowerShell dash is conveniently put in another environment variable called Microsoft Update Service. And then what the WinWord document is actually doing, all you see is WinWord spawned command echo var1 var2. Look familiar? So uh, in the latest version of Invoke Obfuscation, I actually went more step, and I create an environment variable three, which is echo var1 pipe var2. So now all you'll see is command slash z var3. Nothing else, not even an echo. Um, so uh, some of the, uh, these are some of the launcher options that uh, the public version of Invoke Obfuscation has, and these pluses indicate pushing the arguments up to the parent or grandparent process. So that's a really quick uh, look at what obfuscation kind of looks like today. Um, and from a detection perspective, it's actually not, not too great. Um, so again, as I mentioned, a lot of AV isn't really, um, surprise, surprise, catching this. Um, even ones that do in-memory scanning or even that rely on AMSI. It's not a knock on AMSI, it's a super awesome feature, but it still comes down to writing a signature, um, which is uh, difficult in traditional terms to catch some of this kind of stuff, but there totally are ways to do it. Um, it's actually been really neat to see some, uh, even uh, competitors in the industry uh, actually cite some of this work uh, in, as they push out updates to some of their endpoint solutions. So it's been really cool to see as an industry uh, change happening, which is the whole point I'm even doing this is so that as an industry we can all get better together. And then uh, we've actually seen very, very recently um, APT32, uh, which is also known as o uh, Ocean Lotus. They're a Vietnamese um, APT group, and they've actually been using my tool a lot uh, and they, I think their inner key is stuck because they keep doing layer and layer and layer and layer of obfuscation. So I've done, done a lot of deobfuscating of my, uh, of my tool, which has been, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it happy or sad. It's a kind of weird feeling. But uh, it's definitely been interesting to see it uh, used a lot more out there besides just pen testers using it. So I've already mentioned AMSI. Um, and one of the other things, uh, Lee Holmes is a really, really awesome guy at Microsoft. He actually was originally on the PowerShell team at Microsoft, so he kind of helped 
write it, which is pretty sweet. Uh, and now he's a lead uh, security architect at, um, on the Azure team. But um, after I released this tool at DerbyCon, he published this blog post um, called More Detecting Obfuscated PowerShell. And he does some really cool uh, nerdy mathy stuff like character distribution and vector similarity and some really neat stuff that really got me interested and we've been chatting back and forth ever since then and this is actually the basis for um, a presentation that we'll be giving at Black Hat this year of looking at some of these more statistical frequency analysis kind of stuff to detect this code does not look like normal code and how can we actually put that into a machine model to detect this kind of um, uh, obfuscation. So that was, that was recap. What's the new stuff? Let's look at more crafting cryptic cradles. And I have to say, first off, more is an alternate spelling. It comes from more plus roar. I guess it means more loudly. I don't know, internet speak. Um, but we're going to look at three categories. One, obscure cradles. Uh, this is actually a tweet that Graber, Matt Graber, um, who's now with Microsoft, uh, tweeted about a month and a half ago. Um, and does anyone recognize this syntax? It's IEX IWR. So IWR is an alias for invoke web request, which is PowerShell three or later, which is why you don't see it in many attack tools because attack tools usually like to be PowerShell two and four compatible. But this is something that works and it works quite well. And if you're not looking for it as a defender, then yeah, you're at a disadvantage there. So what are, other, uh, what are other cradles that work that we just don't really hear that much about? Well, then look at some token obfuscation that can take a command like this and produce something like this all with completely different obfuscation techniques than what we just talked about. Um, and we'll look at uh, all the different um, kind of tokens that allow us to make this transformation. And then we'll look at some obscure invocation syntaxes that are, in my opinion, probably one of the most important components here because at some point the code has to get invoked. Um, and so if you get really good at catching these, then you're setting yourself up for, um, uh, for an advantage there. So the way that the tool breaks the download cradles um, into groups, and that is disk-based and memory-based. So disk-based, there's a lot fewer options in the tool. But I do want to say most people don't give disk-based cradles much credit, and I would say that a lot of defenders aren't looking for disk-based cradles for that reason. And one, one thing, in my opinion, that I think does not get any um, coverage is the fact that why don't you just download all your PowerShell code to the profile script, and then all you have to do is run PowerShell you don't see any invocation syntax at all here because by nature of the profile script, it's gonna run whenever you run PowerShell. So I think this is a really overlooked um, avenue. Commodity obviously uses PowerShell to download binaries to disk, but if you're just running PowerShell code, there is some advantage to downloading it to disk, in my opinion, uh, if nothing else, just to catch defenders um, off guard. But we have download file, we have uh, bits admin, which is technically deprecated, but it still works, which is the background intelligence transfer service. And then you also have PowerShell's replacement of bits admin, which is the start bits transfer. Now, interesting point here. Um, if you are trying to host a payload on Pastebin or something like that, wherever you're hosting it, if it does not return a file size, bits is not gonna work because of the nature of how it does it. it, has to chunk up the files into different pieces. So it's actually gonna give you this error. So make sure you test wherever you're pointing your payload to because you wanna make sure that bits can actually pull it down. But you may ask, well then why would I even use bits in the first place? Well, it's for this reason right here is that you have CLM, which stands for Constrained Language Mode. Now, in PowerShell 5, um, Constrained Language Mode is uh, typically enforced with AppLocker or something else, but essentially, uh, it's not even, wasn't even designed as a security feature, um, but you can use it as such in that it will basically limit the commandlets that are available in a PowerShell session. It'll constrain the language. So if you're on a system that is in a constrained language mode, which you probably won't see for a couple of years because not many people are doing it, but it's amazing if you do, if you're on that system, then this is a way that you can download code because you can't run that first one because constrained language mode says, yeah, you net that web client, that, that doesn't even exist on the system. You're not allowed to do that. So pretty interesting stuff there. So that was disk-based. Now this is the list of memory-based cradles that are currently in the tool. So I'm not gonna talk about the first one. We've already pretty much covered that, the download string client for the net.webclient net, uh, .net class. Um, download data and open read, very, very similar, except instead of returning a string, they return a byte array or a byte stream, which means you need to add a little bit more context around that command to convert it back to an expression before it's invoked. Invoke web request, this is what was on Matt Graber's tweet earlier. Um, invoke web request and invoke rest method, and with all of their aliases here, are again PowerShell 3 and later. Um, but as such, they also work with constrained language mode. Pretty nice to know. 
Um, number six, this is actually one of my favorites because uh, it has a certain uh, benefit about it that you can use all the way back to PowerShell 2, and that is you can instantiate an object without having to use the new object commandlet, which means there's going to be zero module logs in PowerShell when you run this. Now, obviously, there's going to be script block logs and transcription logs and other things like that, but it's an interesting component that I think is often overlooked. But there's some basic syntax there of how you can create that um, HTTP web request.NET class directly. Send keys. This one is strictly for the lols. This one's in the tool. Please don't bet money on this working, and please don't tell me when it doesn't work, because I know it's kind of shoddy. But I spent way too much time on it to not put it in the tool. So if it works one out of a couple times, then that makes me happy. But the general, the general idea is that it's possible. So let's say you take Notepad as an attacker, and you go to open a file. But maybe you put in a URL instead of a file name. Well, if you open that, Notepad's actually going to fetch that payload for you. So this got me thinking, well, how can I operationalize this? Because this has a really sexy um, component in that, let's say as a defender, you realize, man, there's a lot of obfuscation out there. Why don't I just look for PowerShell making network connections, period? Let me make that another angle in the way that I'm trying to attack this problem. Well, if you do that, and if an attacker does this, then PowerShell's nowhere to be found. Notepad's making a network connection, which is pretty darn suspicious for Notepad. That should be something you're looking for. Let's go ahead and say that up front. But, we can use this send keys class, which is another .NET class, and automate this. Um, and so there, we'll cover some of the artifacts that happen behind the scenes, but this really got me thinking, how can I pawn off behavior and even indicators from PowerShell to other native trusted applications? And as an incident response guy, how can I take that into account and look for these indicators and which ones are very uncommon and which ones are really too common to, to be anything worth uh, looking for. This led me to com object. What's the better way to pawn off uh, network connections and other things with PowerShell? It's com objects. Um, so com is the common object model. Um, Casey Smith and um, Matt Nelson are two of the guys, Sub T and Enigma on Twitter, have done a lot of really good talks on com. And it's, it's older than dirt, and it's kind of getting rediscovered in the security world because there's some amazing things you can do with COM. So basically, what this will allow you to do is, um, with PowerShell, which you can access COM through anything, but with PowerShell, um, you can basically say, let me create an instance of WinWord, Excel, Internet Explorer, completely hidden from the user, and let me have that application go fetch my payload, and then I'll just query it out of it. So you don't have to worry about any weird send keys or notepad popping up for the user or anything like that. A lot slicker model. And when it comes to Internet Explorer, you're actually using the default uh, credentials and proxy information that's in that user's Internet Explorer session. So that's pretty handy. And the last section is inline scripting. So PowerShell is so flexible, uh, it makes it super easy to actually run inline scripts like VBScript, C Sharp is the default, um, and JScript. And so basically, uh, you can create a C Sharp script and then just use this add type command. Um, now, a lot of um, attack frameworks use this add type. A lot of financial threat actors use this, but most people don't know what is actually happening behind the scenes. Because it's really freaking noisy. Add type basically says on the target system, wherever this script lands, PowerShell is going to spawn CSC to compile it, and then it's going to uh, spawn CV CSC is going to spawn CVT res. Um, and so we'll talk about that in the indicators, but it's really noisy, really good for defer people to find this kind of stuff. If you're a red teamer, I would say use this sparingly. Because if you're in an environment where they're not compiling inline code like that, then it is a huge red flag if your um, SOC is looking at that kind of activity. So what's the alternative? And why would you even do this in the first place? Well, if you'll notice, the C-sharp script is actually uh, creating a, a web client class and calling download string. Since C-sharp, even though it's running in PowerShell, since C-sharp is calling that, PowerShell never sees that, and it never hits any of the PowerShell logs. So now, even though PowerShell logs will say, hey, I see PowerShell accessing this .NET class, PowerShell can just host C Sharp, have C Sharp go do all the .NET stuff, and PowerShell logs will never see it. So how do you get the best of both worlds? You just pre-compile your stuff. You do your compilation on your system. So your attacker system has CSC, CVT, res, blah, blah, blah. Then you just read it in as a binary uh, array and shove that in. and the only thing that hits PowerShell logs are the very initial command, which is this load command. In this scenario, this variable bytes encoded is going to be your long string of bytes, which we'll see an example of that in the demo. So that was looking at the two main categories, disk base and memory-based cradles. Um, so next, wh what about the obfuscation? All right. Well, there's kind of 
in a sense, obfuscation in the obscurity component, right? Like if you're not looking for PowerShell com objects with Internet Explorer or PowerShell send keys with Notepad or even C Sharp interactions, like you want to start looking for that. Um, at that point, an attacker doesn't really have to obfuscate it because you may not even be looking for the non-obfuscated version. But let's say you are. How might an attacker obfuscate from this point? Well, we'll look at our uh, familiar example here, but we'll look at how does Cradle Crafter uh, obfuscate it? What kind of options do we have here? Well, the download string uh, method. One of the things we can do is we can say, okay, that's a method of net.webclient, right? So what if we create a net.webclient object just like we're doing in the command, but let's just say .psobject.methods. And this is basically a way to say, tell me about yourself. What kind of methods do you have? What kind of variables do they take? And you'll get this huge list of all these methods that, um, that the object has. You could also do pipe it to get member in PowerShell and get the same uh, stuff in a lot prettier format. And uh, Invoke Cradle Crafter has both of those options built in. But we'll go back with the first one. So PS object methods. Now, if you'll notice, um, we can then say, OK, let me query and let me say where the object name is like download string. And we see here we get our two our overloaded definitions there for a string or a URI. So now what we can do is say, just, yeah, just give me the name. I don't, care about, I don't care about all this other stuff. I just want the name download string. Perfect. So this is a way that we can get download string. Now the last little bit is what's going to make more sense here. Instead of saying like download string, why don't we just randomly choose some wildcarded examples that will only match on download string and replace that. So now this whole big red chunk is download string without ever having to spell download string. This is the kind of stuff we're looking for as an attacker because if you're only looking for a download string, you'll never catch this. So we'll replace that in our command. And one thing I'd like to point out is this dot invoke is only necessary for PowerShell 2. You don't have to use that in PowerShell 3 or later, but since, uh, since the, the tool is compatible with 2 or later, unless it explicitly says this cradle is 3.0 and later, it's going to include that dot invoke so that it works across the board. Um, new objects. So how does Cradle Crafter deal with commandlets? Um, so one of the things that we can do is say git command, which will return a list of all the commands um, unless we specify just one. Um, and so we can then add a dot to actually invoke the object, because this is not text that's coming back. It's just a PowerShell commandlet object. So we can do a very similar trick and say, OK, well, instead of git command, let me randomly choose. This is actually code snippets from the, uh, from the project. Let me randomly choose one of its aliases or the full command. Um, and then for new object, let me randomly choose a wildcarded string. That's what we do right there. So now that is new object. Again, new object does not appear anywhere in this command. Now here's the interesting part. When we started the command, we only had one new object, right? But now we actually have two. When we obfuscated download string, it introduced a new object. So when I built the, uh, all these substitutions, I basically have tags as placeholders. So anytime you obfuscate one component, if there's any other instance of it, it will also obfuscate those. So when we obfuscate this new object commandlet, you'll see it's actually going to obfuscate both of those. So as the commands get bigger, you'll see it actually propagate more changes in more places. Uh, alternatively, this is a PowerShell 1.0 syntax, again, randomly generated from the tool that is also a new object. So obviously a bit more uh, heinous, um, but it actually comes down to um, git command name. That's the wildcarded value right there. And you can see this. This is our new object string right here. And this is so big because it's enumerating every method of the syntax even required to call the method. Now, some other things that are being obfuscated behind the scenes. With invoke obfuscation, since you're dealing with huge scripts, everything is completely random, as random as I could possibly make it. Now, that's good and bad. It's good because it's very random, but it's also bad because me, when I'm using my tool, sometimes I know there's a syntax buried way down in there, and I just run it again and again and again until that syntax comes up. So with Cradle Crafter, I really uh, try to give, uh, to give the user the ability to really pinpoint down and say, I want to obfuscate just this one component just this way. And for most of the obfuscation, you have that control. But there's a couple things that are just not important enough to me. So like where object, every time we'll randomly select one of these syntaxes. For uh, the string like, it'll do like, case sensitive like, or case insensitive like. And then for uh, dollar, uh, dollar sign underscore, this is the current variable. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways you can retrieve the value of a variable. These are just some of the means using git variable or its aliases, git item or its aliases, git child item, which is basically your dir command, um, and its aliases, and then also using dot value 
versus dash value only. And again, the way that parameter binding works in PowerShell, value only works all the way down to V in this case. So any of those substrings are fair game. So we're left with IEX. And um, the one, one last piece that we're able to do, since we really are dealing with a confined set of uh, syntax, is that we can do things like reordering the command or chopping it up into pieces with like logically named variables or very illogically named variables. And we'll see examples of that in the demo in just a minute. So we're left with invoke expression, IEX. What are different ways we can invoke this sucker? So invoke expression, that's kind of the fan favorite. It's typically what everyone's using, and it's something that if you're not looking for IEX and invoke expression on the command line, you're missing a lot of golden opportunities. But please don't stop there, because here's other options. You can use git alias or git command um, with wildcarded uh, strings to produce invoke expression or IEX. You can also use a PowerShell 1.0 syntax, which is a lot uglier, uh, but people really aren't looking at it because most people aren't aware of it. Um, you can use git commandlets um, to, again, basically produce the object of invoke expression. Like in this case, i asterisk produces invoke expression. Pretty crazy. Um, we can also uh, just use invoke script. Um, and, or sorry, I misspoke. This i is invoke, uh, invoke script, not invoke expression. Um, you can also use invoke command, which basically instead of invoking an expression, which is the string, you have to have a script block, but there's ways you can convert strings into script blocks, so there's a lot of options there. Um, PS run space, this is actually a suggestion that uh, Matt Graber had that was really cool, in that you just create an instance of PowerShell, you add a script, which is your payload, and you just do the dot invoke operator to invoke that script. Concatenated IEX, this is really where I've had the most fun. So I'm gonna come back to this in one second. Let's cover the last three real quick. Invoke is workflow, PowerShell three or later. I've never seen this used, but it totally works. Um, and so again, PowerShell three or later. Um, dot sourcing, these are both for the disk-based uh, cradles. Um, you can just dot source your path and it will invoke it. You also have import module or it's aliases IPMO um, to again invoke a script on disk. And uh, Commodity's been doing uh, import module once or twice. So it's been kind of interesting to see commodity malware try out some of the newer stuff. Um, so again, going back to concatenated IEX, this is what invoke obfuscation has. Again, using something like an environment variable like comspec or automatic variables um, like shell ID to, to pull out the letters IEX. So in invoke cradle crafter, th this is the only overlap between the two projects, the only overlap. We basically took this logic and then uh, randomly obfuscated each component of it. So again, instead of always saying dollar sign shell ID, maybe we'll do get variable shell ID dash V for value, and then dir variable shell ID dot value, and that's our I and our E, and again, each piece is randomly obfuscated each time. And there's one more component I added to this, this, this third piece. So there's other ways that we can uh, produce strings in PowerShell. So let's say we have, in this case, it may be a little hard to see, but we have a quote, quote, pipe get member, which in this case, it's an empty string. But you can take any string and say, hey, tell me about yourself. Get member, what do you have? What are you up to? Um, it has a, a nice list of methods and properties and all this kind of stuff. And so you can notice, okay, there's this one method that conveniently has i, e, and x in it. That's pretty cool. So how can we get that? Uh, we can just say string dot index of. And now we have all of our definitions right there. Now, all we need to do is cast that to a string, which is a couple options, but we'll just look at the, the string direct cast with square brackets. And now, this is all one big string. So you can see there's tons of options for i's and e's and x's. So I wrote a script to go through and enumerate every single string uh, uh, method, pull out all the i's and the e's and x's, um, and then uh, randomly choose an i and e and x index to produce i, e, x. So basically, the code looks like this. For each of these, it'll basically go through and randomly choose um, all these numbers. Now, this is not just to be uh, really offensive and mean to blue teamers. It's basically to say, please don't just write a signature based off of number one, number two, number three, and call it a day. Like, we need to think past that because there's so many options out there. So, detecting encrypted cradles. Um, we, we need to move past just looking at PowerShell syntax. What is actually behaving under the scenes? And this is where it comes to, what about PowerShell making network connections? Um, what, you know, like, are, we, are we looking for that? And here's some examples here of, and again, all this information is built into the tool. As you visit each different uh, remote download cradle, it'll have this information and say, hey, here's some indicators, here's some things to look for. So in this case, um, if you use bits admin or start bits transfer, SVZ host makes the network connection, not PowerShell. Um, if you use WinWord or Excel or IE, obviously 
those make the network connections, not PowerShell. And then uh, with Notepad, actually Notepad and SVC host make the network connection, and actually a lot of network connections if it's a large payload. Um, uh, which is an example here of both SVC host and Notepad making a ton of network connections out, um, both to uh, the bit.ly uh, shortened URL and then pastebin forwarded onto after that in this example. Um, Parent-child process relationships. This is really, really good, but attackers are starting to realize you can just rename PowerShell to something else, and that pretty much screws a lot of defenders. So I want you to think about that. Like, How many of your rules are based on process name, is PowerShell, and IEX or NetWeb plant, blah, blah, blah. Like if an attacker just renames PowerShell, and they're totally doing it, like if PowerShell is renamed to Firefox.exe, would that destroy all of your rules? And if it would, then you need to rethink some of those rules. And it's definitely not easy. I'm not talking it down, but we should definitely be aware of this. Because saw it as recently as last week. So, but parent-child process relationships. Um, uh, in like with com objects, PowerShell is never spawning WinWord Excel or Internet Explorer. The existing instance of, F of uh, SVC host spawns those. So you're not going to see that parent-child process relationship there. And it's actually not super uncommon to have SVC host spawn those binaries. Um, send keys, PowerShell spawns a notepad. With inline scripting, you'll see PowerShell spawn CSC uh, or VBC if, they're, if you're doing inline VB script, um, depending on the language there. When it comes to event logs, everything PowerShell has in event logs is solid gold. Now, if you've ever looked at it, there's a lot of gold, so much so that it's hard to carry sometimes. So I definitely acknowledge that it can be very, very noisy depending on your environment, but it's an insane amount of information that's so helpful. Um, Bits admin actually has a log by default, so it'll actually record the nice um, uh, uh, URL that's used. So I'm not saying as an attacker that you should clean up that log. I'm just saying as a defer person, you should probably be looking at that log because it, uh, it'll log some nice stuff there sometimes. DLL's loaded. Uh, so in the com object Internet Explorer example, PowerShell loads this nice little DLL called ieproxy.dll, which it pretty much never does. So sometimes just playing around with Procmon and seeing what's happening here, what's normal, what's not, is a really good way to find indicators. In addition, Razman. This is an amazing uh, set of DLLs, this pair, Razman DLL and Raz API DLL. Stands for Remote Access Session Manager. Now, why is this important? If you use the most basic PowerShell, Cradle, or even the C Sharp ones where PowerShell is loading net.webclient to perform a remote download. It's going to load a lot of DLLs. Here's a few. But why are these two so interesting? Well, these are interesting because they actually create a registry key. They create this tracing registry key, which does nothing else other than be a placeholder to say, hey, I have a .NET application. I want to run some debugging on it and turn on some full-blown tracing. And this is where it's going to say, all right, where do you want that file to go? But just using it will it still create these keys, and there's been several investigations in which some financial groups um, have uh, used PowerShell to download their second stage payload in an environment where they never use PowerShell, and these registry keys lit up, and it was amazing just to see, yep, they touched this system, this system, this one, boom, boom, boom. App Compact Cache, with that same financial threat actor, when PowerShell downloaded the second stage, that second stage contained a shell code loader, and it was not written in PowerShell, it was written in C Sharp which they had in line, which means PowerShell is going to execute CSC and CVT res. So when you look in app compact cache or the shim cache, you would see PowerShell immediately followed by CSC, immediately followed by CVT res. Again, when we sweep the environment, we see this system, this system, this system. PowerShell uh, compiled and executed C sharp code, which was totally not normal in this environment and was another great indicator for us to track this activity. Lastly, cache temporary files. A lot of these uh, memory-only cradles, like WinWord or Notepad or other stuff, they're not truly memory-only. Uh, they're Because you're using an application that wants to provide a lot of you know, speed and efficiency, they'll cache files locally on disk. So if you visit it again, it just pulls a local copy. So if you're using these cradles to download Mimikatz, let's say, that sucker's going to hit disk, um, whether you want it to or not. So just be aware. Uh, as a defender, you should be writing some awesome YAR rules, looking in recent files, temporary internet files, INET cache files, depending on what operating system that you have. And you'll see full-blown payloads sitting there in those files. Whew. All right, let's do a quick demo. My disclaimer is always, as always, please do not use this tool for evil. This is for educational and research purposes, and hopefully it's, you know, it's fun in the meantime. So. Just drop into a PowerShell. I was thinking about it. 
Um, this is, uh, the, both projects are available on my GitHub, which I'll have a link at the very end. Um, and so both of them are very similar in that you just run an import module and then invoke Cradle Crafter PSD1. And invoke Cradle Crafter. And I have to always include some ASCII art. This is an actual example of obfuscating the command, and it actually does produce that. So uh, invoke Cradle Crafter, um, very similar to invoke obfuscation if you've, if you've used that one. Um, basically, uh, in the menus, anything that's yellow, I'm very OCD, so I love colors. And so I tried to add as much as I could to the tool in a meaningful way. Um, although I had one person say, that's great, but I'm colorblind. <laughs> I never thought about that. So if that's you, I apologize. Um, but uh, anything in yellow will take you to a menu. Anything in green will actually do something. It'll actually apply obfuscation or set a value or something like that. So for example, tutorial is in yellow. So we just type tutorial, and it will basically tell us, here's other menus you can go to, here's other things you can do. But to actually set values, then you can use this in green. So we can set a URL. Um, for a remote location. If we're using uh, disk-based cradles, we need to set a path of where on disk we want this to hit. And then optionally, we can also set a post-cradle command, which again, if you think about it, if you're downloading and invoking invoke NimiCats, after it runs, you probably want to actually call the function invoke NimiCats dash dump creds, blah, blah, blah. This is an option. And the reason it's an option is because uh, two of the invocation syntaxes are confined to a workflow or a run space, and so you actually can't just add invoke Mimi cats dump creds to the very end of the cradle. It has to be included in that same context. So that's why it's a part of the, um, uh, of the tool. So let's set a URL to this bitly legit cradle, totally legit, I promise. Um, so you can see our two options here in the menu, we have memory and disk, just like we went through in the talk. So there's our disk-based cradles. We'll go back and look at memory. There's all the, uh, the memory cradles. Um, and so PS web string, this is our most basic one. We'll go in here. And you'll see that for every single cradle, I have this, this big chunk of information about here's dependencies, here's requirements, here's indicators, artifacts. Because again, I want this knowledge to be easy and attainable for anyone, whether you're a blue team or red team. This is stuff we should know about and be looking for. And it shouldn't just be hidden or sold for money or whatever else. Like This is stuff we all need to know about because we all need help defending against attackers. So every cradle has all this information there. Um, and these are our options here in yellow, again, so we can go to rearrange. Um, and so one of the things we can do is chop up into multiple variables named logical names like URL or WC for web client. Um, or we can do random variables. And the, and the order of these also changes as much as it can because some do have to follow the other but that's all handled behind the scenes. So in this case, uh, for example, for URL, we're calling the variable E. So uh, it randomly selects different length uh, strings, et cetera. When it comes to commandlets, again, we cover this. So new object is the default, but we can also do git command. And as you'll see, right now it's doing GCM in ECT. We run it again. It's going to do git command in O. So every component's going to change as much as it possibly can. Or we can do the PowerShell 1.0 syntax which again, you can run a couple times and see it's going to be pretty different. Now, if you'll notice, anything that changes is going to be fluorescent yellow. Everything else is white. Any input that you enter is blue. So at any point when these cradles get really crazy, you can know, OK, all the blue is stuff I contributed, the URL, the post cradle command. Anything that was just obfuscated is bright yellow. So I can see what in the world just changed here, because otherwise, it's really maddening. Um, in addition, you could just go to all, and it will randomly go through every single one and produce something different every time. And you can just run tests at any point to make sure that it still works. Now, I will say, and this is the, the remote payload that we have, uh, by default, I do not add uh, an invocation um, syntax. With all, it does get added. But I want it to be easy to go in and explore and make sure, does my payload actually download? I don't want to invoke this beacon on my system, but I just want to make sure the payload comes down. So the very last thing I'll, uh, I'll show um, is that um, the, the, the compiled, uh, PS compiled sharp, and you can use wildcards and regex and all that stuff. So like for example, you could just go back and say wildcard, randomly choose one, I don't care. Um, so for this, it's gonna take your inline C sharp code, it's gonna go through and it's going to compile it on your system and it's also gonna compress um, adjacent zeros because there's a lot of them, just to save space, cuts the space down in about half. And at any point, you can run clip to copy to clipboard, out to copy it to disk, and finally you can run show at any point it will show you the length of your obfuscated command. It'll show you what you started with. Um, and it'll also give you your command line syntax. So when you start to build a lot of different um, obfuscation options, just copy that sucker out. And now you can just run it straight from CLI, no interaction, nothing like that. 
So that's the end of the demo. Um, and I just want to say, ah, oh, the slides went back. All right. Uh, don't run away from PowerShell. It's really awesome. There's a lot of good security features. Blue team should embrace it. Um, enable logging. Increase the default size. Aggregate those suckers. Look at them. Look for indicators of obfuscation. It's a lot easier said than done, but something we need to do. Don't be afraid of failures. We should share them and all learn from them because none of us get this stuff right on the first try or second or third or fourth. And in avenues like this, a great opportunity to share that kind of information. Lastly, I get to work with a lot of awesome colleagues who really support this kind of research and make it super exciting to hunt for attackers every day. Um, and especially my wife, because she watches me write a lot of code at home, which is surprisingly not the most exciting thing for her to watch me do. And so just a big thank you to her, because it really is a team effort there. Um, so I realize I'm out of time, but I just want to say thank you very much um, for your attention. And I'll be around all day today and tomorrow. So I'd love to, to chat um, and just, uh, just see what you guys are doing and answer any questions I have. So thank you very much.